well, I think that's it. That I think that's that's our, that our dramatic uh, count- countdown. That's it. I think that's our dramatic countdown. So uh, <laughs> good. Well, welcome. <laughs> It's a lovely Heath Robbins to start. Good. Welcome, everyone, to our event on Are You a Hidden Learning Designer? I'm Tony from Ding, and this is... I'm Phil from Ding. Yeah. <laughs> um, so thanks for joining us today. So I appreciate that people are probably on their lunch break, and so we're going to try and make this session as engaging as possible. We may go for an hour, or we may only go for 20 minutes. We'll, we'll see how we go. But the broad aims of this session are really t- to explore this concept of learning design. So Phil and I, very briefly, we run uh, Ding Learning, a learning design agency and we found it very fascinating over the last year to look at this idea of learning design and to try and figure out what it means i think neither of us would have considered ourselves to be learning designers initially um but we we found that obviously through setting up ding that hopefully we're quite good at it but actually it was something that we, we didn't really sort of plan to do so um the, the aim of today is basically just to clarify what is learning design what's a hidden learning designer and just sort of give you an insight into uh, some of the things that that we do and to help you understand a little bit about whether you might be a hidden learning designer. The, the kind of the rationale briefly behind this was to explain that there's there's a lot of learning design vacancies at the moment. And I think the interesting thing about uh, learning design is that it provides a career option for people who've got educational skills, but would never normally have considered themselves to be a learning designer. So just before we go on, um, We're going to use a tool called Mentimeter through this just to get a little bit of audience participation. So I'd encourage you, if you'd like to participate and share your comments, share your thoughts and some of the questions, if you just go to menti.com on your mobile phone or scan that QR code on the screen and just enter the code on the screen, then you'll be able to participate and share your thoughts. Because I think the more that we can get feedback from you during this session, the better, the more we can respond to your comments. So please either put your uh, thoughts through Mentimeter or just type into LinkedIn Live and, and share your comments. So that there's the comments on the screen there. So I just want to kick off with asking you what your current job title is. So to those of you who are tuning in, um, if you could just take a minute, go to menti.com, enter the code and just share your current job title because I'd love to, I'd love to know who we've got in the room. While you're doing that, um, we're going to talk a little bit about learning design film. Yeah, well, I I suppose you might say that the provenance of this session began from a very honest and open conversation I had with Tony because I was experiencing this phenomenon where in my new role, um, when I was out socially, you know, people would say, hello, what do you do? And I would give them the job description learning designer. And then there would be a moment of silence people would blink at me and then I would discover that I would have to probably spend the next five to seven minutes explaining what that role was and I discovered that as I did it I was pulling on more and more synonyms and sort of it was becoming more diffuse so in the attempt to kind of explain what learning design was I began to reach out and and talk about other things and I could always feel that by the end of that conversation I felt that I'd almost done learning design uh, a misservice because I'd made it seem less credible, less concrete, less like something that that you could ask for or talk about sort of plainly. Um, And I brought that to Tony and I just wanted to know if Tony had had a similar experience of whether he was in a community of people who instantly understood the term, if people were instantly identified in that way or what. So I guess that's the question I would just ask you, Tony, about what's been your experience of how learning design lands with other people as a as a definitive or a self-explaining job description? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's a really great question. And it's interesting to look at some of the responses coming through here. So we've got principal product developer, art teacher, coach, library advisor, teaching junior product designers, uh, lecturer, pathway leader. So a really broad range of skills already in those nine responses. And yeah, very briefly, my background is learning technology. So I used to support people with uh, learning technology and sort of developing technology-based activities and then ran a teacher training course. And I didn't really know that I was a learning designer until I got hired to be a learning designer, which was quite a strange experience. Once I left a job in higher education and was uh, invited to join an organization and join a team of learning designers, it was only then that I realized that I had the knowledge and skills to be a learning designer, which I found fascinating because before that, I never would have called myself a learning designer. And you could say, I suppose, in the last 18 months of running Ding, 
I think both you and I have figured out that we had all the skills to be learning designers because we were doing it, but we would never have called ourselves yeah. a learning designer prior to that. Is that fair, Phil? Absolutely. And I just want to ask you then, and this is not a staged question because I never, I've never asked you this question. It's like when you were applying for the role as a learning designer, were you having a um, an attack of imposter syndrome? How did you um, attach yourself? Was it that the job description itself um you recognized the job description or you recognized yourself in what they were asking for or how how did you how did you decide that that was you um, yeah absolutely I, it was there was a massive amount of imposter syndrome so it was walking into an environment and being asked to design uh, a, an assessment rubric and some powerpoint presentations and it was all to do with data my background was not data at all so there was a huge amount of just don't blink and just sort of say yes i can do that whilst figuring out like what are they actually asking me? And then there was this, you know, very quick re realization that was like, oh, hang on, this is this is about designing a program of learning experiences. Yeah, of course I've done this. The, probably the weirdest thing that I would say to, to people listening is that learning designers often don't teach, and that that for me was the paradigm shift when when I was asked to basically design this program of learning. I said, what well, you want me to build all these things, but not teach it and not assess it? And they went, yeah. I was like, okay, that sounds great <laughs> but it was very odd because you know you're used to doing the whole thing and this is where this whole idea of hidden learning design has started to come from it's you know there's a lot of people working in educational roles who do this stuff all the time um but would never necessarily call themselves a learning designer so thank you very much for everyone for, for sharing your comments there so i'm just going to go back to the presentation because there's a concept that we've tried to use to explore this this idea of learning design which is something called rubens vase phil do you want to say a little bit about why this concept stood out for you as a useful uh, concept for explaining learning design? Well, we've been doing a lot of consultancy work um, and, and with, with, with um, sort of different sort of um, types of, of people. And one of the things that kept coming up in a lot of the work was people struggling to characterize what they did. And, and so we, we started off talking about a concrete part of their jobs. And then when it got down to how effective they were in those jobs, suddenly the conversations would move sideways and people would start to pull on all these other skills that were actually responsible for manifesting their success in that sense. And I began to think about that um, visually and thought, well, you know, what does it mean if we're trying to describe ourselves in a particular way and we think we've grasped it, we've got this very obvious thing that we do, but actually that very obvious thing is put into representation for other people by these other skills and it reminded me very much of this you know famous optical illusion which is that you know when you look at it you see the vase that's the obvious thing the easy to ask for the easy to grasp but of course it's compressed or sort of formed by these two faces which i you know took to be the perhaps hidden skill sets or the things that we're doing all the time the more discursive interactive things I don't like the phrase soft skills very much because I don't think soft skills are soft as, at all. In fact, my conclusion would be that they are impactful and powerful. But there was a bunch of things around um, a more traditional job description that people were doing. So Rubens Vars for me became a way to talk to the problem of me particularly trying to talk about learning design. Because every time I try to talk about learning design, i.e. go to the middle of the idea, I'd end up drawing on all of the things around it. And I've seen that happen again and again and again. Um, and so I, I, for me, it's a great capture of um, the challenge of where the skills live and how can you identify them quickly and easily for other people. Yeah, I think that's a really, really useful way of, of explaining it and conceptualizing learning design, because as I say, often you see, you see the output, which is the, the session or the course or the course documentation or the PowerPoints or whatever it is, but you don't necessarily call that thing learning design. Yeah. So you, you see the output, but not the process. So, yeah, I think you're absolutely right. I think Ruben Sars is, is a really good way of, of explaining that and sort of trying to, to bring into, into relief what is uh, otherwise sometimes a little bit invisible uh, as a concept. You also, I think you've referred to it as the donut problem in the past where, you know, you, you can see the donut, but you can't see, you, you fall through the bit in the middle when you're trying to explain a problem. Yeah. Um, so, uh, right, just wanted to, we've got a few bits and pieces coming through in the chat. So I just wanted to say, if you do have questions, we're going through this. We've got chats uh, coming through a little bit on the uh, on the chat on the, uh, on LinkedIn. So if you do want to post us questions as we're going through, please just drop your questions in the chat. And we would obviously do our best to answer them as we, as we go through this. All right, so 
Uh, where are we? Uh, hang on a second. He said, trying to press too many buttons at once. Um, <laughs> uh, now I've got too many windows open. Okay, so we're going to have a little bit of a look at uh, what learning designers do, just to hope, hopefully to help you start to see yourself in this role, because I suspect there's there's quite a few people here who qualified would qualify to be learning designers, but wouldn't necessarily call themselves a learning designer. So if you go to Mentimeter, I'd, I'm just interested to know what learning design looks like to you. What images does it bring to your mind? So if you've got your device handy, uh, just uh, you should already be on the code, but if not, go to menti.com, enter the code. And I'm curious to know what learning design looks like to you. Uh, if you if you try and conceptualize learning design, what do you see it as? When have you seen people doing it? Uh, what does it make you think of? Because as I say, when, when I first started doing learning design, I didn't really understand what it was until it became a little bit clearer what I was being asked to do. And suddenly I realized I'd been doing it for a long time. So if we go back to some of those, the roles that you shared earlier on, if you're uh, working, um, train, if you're training people or if you're a senior lecturer or, or if you're working in IT, like what do you imagine learning design is as a concept? What, what does it bring to your mind and what do you think it is? Because learning designers certainly do a, a broad range of tasks but it often means different things to different people. And it's only once you're in role and doing it that it suddenly starts to become clearer what it is. So I'm curious to see what uh, what you think learning design looked like. I mean, Phil, I'll just ask, while we're waiting for a few responses to come through, I'll just ask you that question. When when we first started doing this and when we first joined Ding, what what did it look like to you when we, we started to call ourselves learning designers and we sort of built Ding as a learning design agency? What was your initial view of what it looked like? What did it bring to your mind? Well, I will say that, again, I'll just refer to perhaps what other people suggested they thought it was in some of those conversations, those slightly torturous conversations. People say, what is it that you do now? And so a lot of people will um, assume that it's to do with um, building assets. So um, I come from a sort of a design background, so sort of art and design, creative subjects. So for me, when I look at the word design, design leads always. and um, to the point where you think well it's about designing powerpoints then isn't it or it's about <laughs> designing artifacts that you're going to give away or people are going to interact with um so design as being an output um uh, function a function of kind of you know slide decks and so on and so forth so a lot of people if you when you talk about learning design um assume that it's a, a powerpoint or a slide deck or a um like a publishing uh, function essentially yeah. and i would say that it is those things as well right tony it's not yeah. that's not um that's a big that's a part of it certainly the output is part of it and i think for a, when people ask for learning designers um i think sometimes they're asking for people to to publish learning resources they think yeah. of it in that terms as sort of building out artifacts right absolutely and there's a whole debate between what is learning design what is instructional design which we're definitely not going to get into today but yeah. you're absolutely right there is a there is a, a large component of learning design that is around i suppose you'd use the term building assets it is often the term it's building learning assets which could range from powerpoints to videos to assessment rubrics it's the stuff basically it's the, it's the stuff that you use to to deliver learning experiences really fascinating thank you everyone for these comments coming through i mean this this just really provides a great insight into the the nebulous nature of learning design it's like what is what does learning design mean to you we've got knowledge exchange we've got mentoring Immersive learning, learning by doing, uh, creativity, being adaptable to learners, partly using pictures, scaffolded learning. We've got things about the length of it, not too long, structuring, guiding. I mean, this is fascinating. Phil, what, what's your take on that coming through? Well, there? I think um, for me, the one that I can imagine using and then having to explain would be a sequence of experiences because this is this really, to me, cuts to what was important to me when I was teaching was it was always about um, the experience that the learners were having. So that was always my preoccupation. And I used to meet sort of other um, sort of tutors or, or people who who were very interested in um, in their knowledge base, if you like, their knowledge base. And they felt that in 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 the in their expertise, their expertise guaranteed the student experience. And I always wasn't always as convinced by that. I always felt that I needed to do more to produce an experience in the room 
and my expertise was part of that but i also had to worry and think and imagine a bunch of other things to ensure that my expertise found a home in the room or whatever and so for me the idea of of taking my expertise and a curricula or whatever it was and from it creating a successful sequence of experiences for me very much that is and i will say this now is that when um, tony often has to reassure me that i am a learning designer um, <laughs> and when he does that he will remind me of the the success of my sequencing of experiences yeah. as borne out by um 10 years experience working with um undergraduates uh, so so I, lo I look at that one and i think that that, that idea of um sequence and experience are two really key descriptors of of the art um of learning design i'd say so i don't know who put that in there but yes that 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 really um works for me yeah that's a, it's a great one i think like you say learning design is often about imagining the sequence of experiences from point of enrollment to point of whether it's graduation or finishing the program or whatever but it's like what is that sequence of experiences and within that how do you do some of these other things on there how do you involve how do you include mentoring how do you yeah. guide how do you create experiences where you learn by doing what, what materials do you need uh, what role does collaboration play in that sequence of experiences so there's some fantastic responses there but i think that that really starts to provide an insight into why learning design can be a little bit difficult to apprehend sometimes because mm -hmm. it, it's all of these things it's yeah it, it's a, it's a it's a collection of activities that people involved in education will be familiar with that that produce an output which is a sequence of experiences so thank you all for that that's that's really interesting to to capture your thoughts on that um just a quick vote uh just for, for those of you on the call so this is just a quick multiple choice so have you ever done any of these things have you ever created lesson plans developed assessments uh given written feedback written learning outcomes or produced powerpoints and presentations so let's just get a quick measure of um whether you've done these things because as we've seen in that previous slide there's a whole load of activities that go into learning design but th these are some of the things that people in educational roles often do who wouldn't call themselves learning designers so you, if you're a teacher for example you've probably created a whole load of session plans uh, you've probably developed assessments or you've given feedback um, you might not have written learning outcomes because they may have been given to you but you may well have produced powerpoints and presentations and this is very much reflected of, as I say, when I first started working as a learning designer, suddenly realized that I'd done all the things that learning designers do without calling it learning design. So I think because it was called teaching. Because it was called teaching. Yeah. It was called teaching. Um, which it also, which it's uh, um, again, another visual metaphor uh, that always sits in my mind is those nested Russian dolls, those toys where, um, you know, and that to me uh, you can get yourself in a terrible muddle in a way about thinking about what the hierarchy is that does learning design um sit inside teaching does teaching sit inside learning design or does curriculum design sit inside teaching so it goes on and i think that it that speaks to the um to the difficulty uh of it and also sometimes the frustrations around the way the word learning design seems to feel very concrete and very about something that we should all understand something we should all recognize and just as a couple of the slides have demonstrated that there that it diffuses very quickly mm -hmm. um and in that respect if you begin to look at some of these responses coming in that a lot of the activities that are if you like abstract the ability to imagine a learning experience the ability to sort of put a lesson plan together the ability to imagine a sequence of experiences um, all of that actually isn't as discipline specific mm. as some of these activities make us think they are, that mm. we can only plan a lesson about something that we know ourselves or understand, that we can only uh, produce a, a successful sequence for somebody else if it's about a subject that we know very, very, very well indeed. And for mm. me, that's always been um, a, a barrier because I've always been very uh, protective of my specificity you know i know about a certain subject i know it very well and if i'm asked to think about that learning for an, an, an another sort of student another discipline i instantly think well i can't do that because i'm an imposter um i don't have that knowledge um, and tony you're right you've, you've sort of reassured me a number of times uh or, or around that issue right yeah i think this is this is this is it and this is often the paradigm shift uh, that people go through when they're going into learning design 
uh, is that you you have to get out of your own discipline and you realize that learning design is something separate from uh, from your discipline. Um, I've just had a few comments in the chat there. I've realized that you could only select one of those things, but there's some people who've said all of the above. So apologies for that. Um, yeah, <laughs> there's probably people who are trying to press multiple options but not able to. So thank you for letting me know about that. But you're absolutely right, Phil. I think the, the, the point here is that um, as a learning designer, sometimes you have to walk into uh, uh, a program or a build and not know anything about it. And I think, you know, for the last year, we've been building data programs. And it, and it has been fascinating because you just have to kind of like take a deep breath, dive in and and sort of draw on the skills that you know you have. And, it, and it's things like, well, what's the learning outcomes? Uh, what's the, the knowledge of the people coming into the course? Are they beginner, intermediate, advanced? How long is the course? You know, what, what's the, what is the environment? Is it online? What's the best environment? You know, and then you don't need to know about the subject. And that's the other weird thing. You know, you, you know about learning, but you don't need to know about data or cybersecurity or whatever it is. You need to know how to get that information from a subject matter expert. And that can feel very odd to start with because you're used to being the person who knows about the subject. So I think, yeah, that, that is another thing to be mindful of there, that, um, that as learning designers, you do you often walk into subjects that you know know nothing about and just have to have confidence that you know about learning and you know how people learn and that you've created learning experiences and as long as someone can provide you with the, the subject specific knowledge that you can build an effective sequence yeah. of experiences around that so okay um just to give some examples here so uh, we thought we saw in that previous activity um some examples there although you probably couldn't press as many buttons as you wanted apologies um but yeah some basic examples of learning design as we say creating a session or a lesson plan um often writing an assessment brief uh, in in any discipline you might have been involved in possibly planning a new module or a course or a training program or revise even if it's just revising an existing lesson so often you'll find that people don't consider themselves to be uh teachers let alone learning designers so you might find that you're you're a technician or you're a student support person or you're and you're working with the course team to revise a lesson or a module that, that doesn't work or you're trying to make it better or you're working with a course team to improve a, a module or kind of redesign a course all of these are examples of learning design but often you wouldn't call yourself or you wouldn't call that activity learning design you'd call it reflecting on teaching um but what you are doing is looking at the learning design and identifying where it might not be working, where it could be better, and and putting that into practice. So, Phil, I think can you think of any other examples of learning design that from your? Well, I just I just want to quickly come in. For, for, um, there's a question in the chat from Joel, which is um, asking you know a simple question, which is the question I've asked myself and yourself many times, which is like, you know, do you need to know something about the subject? In terms to be a learning designer, and I mean, we'll get to that a little bit later. I think around the uh, the the role of subject matter experts and that relationship, which is how you extract and derive um, the, the the specific knowledge um, from someone else. Which is that so basically, your role moves from being the container of that knowledge yourself, and also the learning designer, you know, putting it out there, to working with someone else and sort of. Um, um, mining their expertise so I think we will talk a bit about that later but I, I want to talk about black market sort of learning design really and I can't see um, I, don't, I don't know if there are some sort of um, former colleagues of mine in the in the chat but I work very closely with somebody uh, for yeah yeah consistently for a long time on my course who I know because of their orbit around the curricula and around the behaviors of students and around the behaviors of the institution develop a very acute black market knowledge of learning design in other words very clear expertise around the units on particular programs that kept throwing up the same problems um, uh, there were different departments in support of academic courses that if you sort of um, got all of their knowledge together you would realize that they had developed an, a sort of um, <clears throat> a slightly beleaguered expertise around failing units and projects that were poorly worded and, and you'd often hear this knowledge whispered about or sort of you would I would often encounter it as people rolling their eyes when the same situation happened again sort of year on year on year on year so I think there was often a, um, 
black market expertise around uh, uh, learning designers who were sort of um, essentially experienced their expertise and knowledge as frustration because yeah. essentially they were down river from something. They were down river from some poor learning design that had been sort of an accident of history or an accident of the institution, but they were always mopping up. They were performing triage. They were sort of fixing and putting plasters on that problem. And that when I would speak to those um, to those individuals, the fixes, um, the knowledge around how something could be lifted or improved lived in them. And it lived in the people who were supporting courses and who were sort of uh, dealing with students on that day to day basis and just understood that there were certain things that weren't quite right in the jigsaw puzzle of a, of a course design. But they themselves weren't really able to to um, reconfigure it in any sort of like lasting way. So there was like black. There was a lot of black market expertise. That's what I would call it sort of experts who weren't necessarily in representation or able to to deploy their expertise usefully. Yeah, and I think that, I mean in many ways that those experiences and those discussions that we've had have, is is what's given rise to this concept of the hidden learning designer. And I guess Joel, to your question in the chat, do you need to know something about the subject? I think if you look at, for example, people who work in the library. So you've got. Um, uh, learning development tutors, you might have student support assistants, uh, learning support assistants, uh, you might have librarians, learning and teaching librarians. All of these people are working with students across disciplines. You know, so in a university context, certainly students come in and they might be on animation or they might be on film production or they might be on, you know, uh, business management. It doesn't really matter, but they come to a learning specialist because they have a problem with not being able to learn what is needed of them. And yeah. that learning specialist has to be able to look at the learning outcomes, the student, the, the problem, why they can't understand the brief. And it's about how you how you look at those core, uh, those core assets and say, well, what is the problem here? Is it a lack of comprehension? Is it a poorly written learning outcome that yeah. unfortunately you can't change? Because as Phil says, you're downstream from it. But often these people are working across disciplines. They might not know anything about animation or photography or architecture but they they have to figure out what that barrier is to learning and i think that that really encapsulates what a hidden learning designer is is that you're you're dealing with the 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 implications of a learning design issue um, yeah. and you're responding to that by supporting students but you'd never necessarily call yourself a learning designer but you have all of those knowledge and skills to fix that problem uh, and that really is where this hidden this hiddenness comes from i guess would you say phil yeah no i mean I think that's where as well as I've had to accept in a sense um, my 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 identity as a learning designer as opposed to someone who's, who um, is discipline specific uh, when I've been working in these other roles. I, I take comfort from a couple of anecdotes which help me understand that learning design doesn't sit inside of subject matter expertise, doesn't necessarily live in there. And one really simple example is this. From my experience was when um, I took a simple decision as a course leader. I looked at the prevalence of stress around the handing in of written assignments. Mm -hmm. It was simple that. So not, and so that's a general thing. I wasn't running those units, but I could see um, the the every year there would be um, what I would see to be exaggerated heightened levels of stress around written assignments. And some of it was because the students that I work with didn't um, love or enjoy that aspect. But then I looked at when the hand-ins were, and it was an accident of history that the hand-ins were always very early in the morning. So it was like, your essay needs to be uh, in by 10 o'clock, otherwise the office is gonna be shut, you need to put it through Turnitin, blah, 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 blah. I thought to myself, why are we saying that essays have to be in at 10 in the morning? Is there a learning outcome about um, in those essays about um, getting up on time, catching the train, um, having to drop your kids off at school, having to negotiate all these other hidden things in order to get an essay in? Or is that just a bad bit of the sequencing? Is that a bad bit of sequencing? And I just decided that we moved the hand-ins for the essay to four o'clock in the afternoon. Um, and instantly, there was a sea change around that and if there were anxieties and stress it was about things to do with the, the written assignment not about some of these other things and i take comfort from that very small boring maneuver because 
I think that was a learning designs learning designers maneuver because it was about the sequencing of the experience of these learners it wasn't even about the written assignment it was about where the blocks go and I thought well okay with that knowledge and I've I've used that knowledge like a spanner to to look at and unpick multiple problems in programs of learning that have got nothing to do with the subject matter that I particularly um, um, studied in myself. Yeah, and I think that that's a, that's a really nice way of, of it's, a, it's a great example because it highlights what what we often talk about in learning design is well certainly what you and I talk about is maneuvers. And I think as a learning designer, you're constantly looking at the effect that an activity produces. Like if if the hand is at ten, what does that produce? Or if this activity happens on this site over here, what's going to make students want to go? Or if we put students in teams what's going to make that work or not so you're constantly looking at if I do this what effect will it produce and is that going to work within that sequence of experiences to use that phrase from earlier on the really useful phrase so I think as a learning designer you are it's almost like you put on x-ray specs and you're looking at it going okay if this happens here what happens upstream from that and what happens downstream from that and is that the right thing is that the effect that I want to produce so it's yeah, it, and this is, I suppose, in many ways, it just brings what you're doing as a, as a teacher or a lecturer into a bit more sort of sharp relief. You just start to consider the blocks, as you were saying, Phil, a little bit more clearly. Like, if if I do this, then this happens. Um, yeah, Charlotte's just said in, in the chat there, good manoeuvre example. Yeah, it's like, what what are these manoeuvres? Because there are, I suppose, I'm not going to say there's loads, but there are there are a few common ones that that we've that we've talked about on the blog and in some of our some of the previous podcasts you know, around teamwork and some of these these core manoeuvres. And we'll get into that, I think, in future LinkedIn Lives. What are some of these core manoeuvres from learning design? But I just wanted to, to, to obviously follow on from what you were saying earlier, Phil, about SMEs. So just to, to give you uh, all a, a bit of an insight, if you're not familiar with this term of learning design, what does it look like perhaps in a, in a less educational context? Because yeah. I think you've got to bear in mind here that learning designers in a higher education context, it's, it's still a growing role but certainly in a business context I mean if you look at LinkedIn you go into LinkedIn jobs and you type in learning designer there's over 10,000 vacancies in the UK and the US alone around learning designers but it's all for people like Tesco and Amazon and whoever you know like big organizations so what do these people do my take on it and I think you know over the last year Phil and I've been doing podcasts to try and identify what what's caused this emergence of learning design alongside other design disciplines like UX design and service design and what's the intersection of this and I think it's it's still very much in formation but I think there's been a growing realization post COVID of the value of retraining staff uh, in an organization rather than hiring partly because it's cheaper to retrain than it is to, to constantly hire but also there's a need to really evolve people's thinking around the business need. So I think first and foremost, learning designers in a corporate context and in an academic context, you could say, identify the business need. What needs to happen with this course? Why does it need to exist? What problem does it solve? How does it deliver the strategy? How does it deliver the the school strategy or the, the business strategy? Once you know what the business need is, it might be around improving, as I say, developing data literacy, or it might be about developing a new course in uh, in fine art. It could be all sorts of things. But then the idea is that you find someone who's an expert in that and you work with them to produce relevant learning outcomes. So you say, OK, if we're going to have a course in cybersecurity, for example, what do people need to be able to do at the end? So you start with your learning outcomes, you work on the learning outcomes and you work backwards to then build out a learning experience to say, OK, we're taking people to be able to do cybersecurity at a certain level, might be beginner or intermediate or advanced. Where's the start point? What expertise are they coming in with? And what is that end-to-end experience? You know, what what do they need to know coming in? How long have we got? How many sessions? How long's the course? What kind of activities are gonna work? Is it flexible? Is it hybrid? Is it uh, synchronous? Um, And then what assets do they need? So once we know what the experience is, What's the stuff that we need to give them? How many PowerPoints are we gonna need? What kind of videos do we need? Then how do we assess it? How do we know that they've made it? How do we know they've met the learning outcomes? So building some kind of assessment rubric. So that then builds out effectively the learning design. And then usually the final stage is the learning designers work with the people who will be delivering that course. So either teachers or coaches or facilitators to explain the learning design and then to train them on key aspects of it. So you can see it's, as, as if you're in an educational role 
uh, teaching or lecturing, you'll probably, you might not be doing the working with SMEs because you might already be the SME, but in a learning design role, often you don't know about the subject, so you work with the expert, but broadly, you're still building out that end-to-end -end experience and creating all the stuff that you need to deliver that. So well, I just want to be reassuring there and say that if some of you listening are thinking um, already that you can feel your imposter syndrome being activated, um, and I think imposter syndrome is, is an unavoidable uh, expression of, of um, self-awareness, um, I think, particularly if you're moving um, discipline to be moving around. I will often have this bit of shtick when I meet an SME or I'm in a Zoom meeting for the first time and I will define myself as the idiot in the room. Now, I know I'm not an idiot, um, right? But the fact that I am going to ask an SME a question that is blindingly obvious to them, you know, so um, because I don't know anything about cybersecurity and they use um, a particular phrase or they imply some knowledge because I don't have that knowledge. One of my most powerful contributions is to go, sorry, um, I don't know about that. Could you explain it? And then you realize that um, then you then you realize what's happened is that you found another piece of the curricula that needs to be sequenced, um, made um, obvious because expertise is its own cloaking mechanism. Expertise cloaks the stuff that non-experts require because we once you know a subject very well, you know it. It's very hard to sort of unknow it and know it at the same time. And one of the strengths and I think um, one some of the power of a great learning designer is to have the courage to keep saying, sorry, I didn't understand that. Could you could you help me understand that? And then you start to realize the curricula is writing itself. Um, and I think that to sort of worry about not knowing what people are saying and pretend that you do is not a great learning designer maneuver. Um, you, you have to sort of you leverage your um, unfamiliarity as power. Uh, as a learning designer um, that's 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 the way I I don't know if you agree with that Tony if you see that as being um... massively and the only thing I'd add to that is that in many ways you're playing the role of the learner which is really valuable because ultimately your learners probably don't know about this either otherwise they wouldn't be on the course so in many ways your job as a learning designer is to ask the obvious questions and say I'm sorry I don't understand what that means or I'm sorry, I don't know why they need to learn. Why do they need to learn this? Why is this important? And actually, that's another powerful question because if you're working with an SME or an expert, I mean, they'll they'll give you everything in the kitchen sink. They'll say, right, all this is important. They need to do this. They need to be this. And, and your job is to go, well, if the outcome is this, why do they need to learn this other thing that might be really interesting, but completely not relevant to this course? So as Phil says, I think leveraging your imposter syndrome is actually a key aspect of what learning designers do and, and it, it, it makes it makes it really it makes your work much more powerful if you can work with that yeah. and and so and this is really then where it's just to sort of follow that this is what hidden learning designers effectively do uh, they, they have knowledge of pedagogy or learning theory so you might have you might have done a teacher training course or you might have done some exploration of, of learning theory um ideally you'll be able to empathize with learners because as a learning designer you really have to think about who is this course for? What do they know or not know coming in? How likely are they to want to collaborate? Uh, how far can we take them in a week, 10 weeks, a year? So the more that you can empathize with your learners, um, the more effectively you'll be able to sequence those activities. And also the more you will be able to identify and remove barriers to learning. And again, this is where people working in sort of education, educational roles who wouldn't call themselves learning designers are often doing this job already they're often identifying barriers in the curriculum barriers in the in the facilities um barriers in the assets and they're trying to work to remove those and then i suppose just to sum that up as, as we've said the idea is to understand those key moments in a learning experience what is the point of entry what is what are these maneuvers what are the blocks the building blocks of that sequence of activities what happens at the start what are the key points what's the assessment uh, and, and where do they need to get to at the end? So it's that you have that ability to see into the learning experience and sort of break it down into its constituent parts. So, so that, that sort of gives you an insight into what hidden learning designers really do. So 
just to go back on to um, menti.com, uh, for those of you who are still able to jump onto Menti, and I'd really just love to hear a little bit about if you've worked with students in the past, what are some of the most common FAQs you've received? So if you haven't worked with students in the past, just think about common FAQs that you might have received about learning. If you're working in an IT role, for example, what are some of the common requests that you've received from people about things that they can't do? Because often that's a good starting point for mm learning design, you identify the things that people ask you about repeatedly, and then you think, okay, well, there's there's something that needs to be learned here. Um, what is it? Um, Phil, what are some of the most common FAQs you used to receive from your students? I think um, it, there would often be some of the most common FAQs would be, why do I have to learn this at all? <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and I'm laughing there because, you know, the temptation is, is to say, just because um it's like why do i have to do for me one of my um passions was to in, because i believe that certainly with the students my students and where we were sort of demographically with students i felt that literacy was hugely important alongside all the other creative things because i wanted my students to be powerful um i wanted them to be able to compete uh in terms of sort of the written word and um to understand power structures through writing and how writing was was powerful and how if you weren't aware of that then you were sort of at a disadvantage and so when i spoke about why do we have to write essays why do we have to do blog posts why do we have to do this why do we have to do that um i figured out really early on that that faq was a call to action um mm. a, a, in terms of learning design that you had to involve your learners in why you were building the curricula in a particular way. So as opposed to having the curricula as something that was being done unto the students, it was sort of something that you were, um, you had to explain its intentions, you had to elucidate and make transparent. And I think that sort of onboarding um, is is fascinating. Um, I've just seen um, my former colleague, Jackie Hagen say, snap, that's just what I said. Um, <laughs> but this, this, this notion of, of not asserting a curricula and ass asserting a curricula um, absolutely is the job of the learning designer who um, fashions it whatever but I think the idea that that's that that's the end of it so for me a lot of FAQs are the why do I have to do this why do I have to learn it that way and it might be that those FAQs are diagnosing an issue but it may just be that the project of the learning has not been elucidated, that the project of the learning, that the ambition, that the course philosophy is um, not expressed in a way that's actually landing with people. So I think so many FAQs start really early on in, in terms of learning design, like that, that the earliest point, really. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think this, this is interesting just seeing those some of those comments coming through there, the, the why. One of the, I think one of the most powerful things that used to happen when I was running the teacher training course was when people started to talk about learning outcomes with students. And we'd say, right, start a session by at least acknowledging the learning outcomes. So I'd bring, bring them into the session and just say, this is why we're doing this. And, and it would suddenly sort of head, head off that why. It's, it's like, well, this is, this is why we're doing this, because these are the outcomes. And it's often that it, it might be that that was a technician doing that. And, and they'd say, this is why we're doing it. And actually the, the tutor that, on the course they were working on hadn't explained the learning outcomes. So I think nailing that why and really unpacking that why is one of the most common places to start. And to be honest, it's one of the most powerful things you can do in learning design is to say, well, why are we doing this? Why is this important? Why is this activity relevant over another activity? So yeah, how do I get support with academic writing? Does this actually work? What else have we got there? How do I get an A? <laughs> uh, and we can't, yeah, how do I get an A? What does coursework look like? Yeah, absolutely. So um, these are often good places to start in terms of the learning design, because if you're getting these FAQs, it's often because these things aren't addressed in learning design and, and they are often the things that students are struggling with and that could be adapted and incorporated by addressing the learning design. If you're getting these FAQs, it's like, why, why is that happening? Why has that not been addressed or headed off or put somewhere or made obvious or talked about? So, okay, thank you for that. So a um, little bit about FAQs, yeah, am I doing it right? Uh, and yeah, how to get support with academic writing and understanding why a process is important. I, th I think that's also, that's really good. So talking about process and not just about you're going to learn this um, just, just for the sake of it. Okay, and just wanted to, we've got, only got a, a few minutes left, but really I wanted to just um, say what underpins or what we've, I suppose, distilled our experience into at Ding. And we've come up with this sort of six 
the six uh, colors of learning design model, you call it. Um, and this was really just to try and explain a little bit about how we at Ding interpret learning design, because you know you can go and search on Google or whatever, and you'll find a whole ton of stuff on on learning design. Because it's a for me, it's, it's a fascinating and emerging discipline. But I think at Ding, what we try and do is is try and make it as simple to apprehend as possible. Because as you've seen from this discussion, it can be a little bit nebulous and and, and hard to hard to express. So I think over, over the course of the last year, um, we, we put together this model, and this was really an, an attempt to sort of make it a bit more simple. Phil, do you want to sort of explain a little bit about the rationale behind this and how how you ended up at at these kind of six colours and, and why you chose these ones? Well, I'm always, rightly or wrongly, trying to make sure we're talking about things in the right order. Um, so I'm always looking for something that's irreducible. So in other words, it's often, like I said, talk, talking about learning design with people and you end up talking with synonyms and I'm, and you sort of get lost in the weeds. And it's just trying to be brave and and uh, around it and, tr and trying to arrive at something that you feel absolutely captures it. That's not a synonym. That's kind of like the the mothership, really, of an idea. And so we've spent a lot of time thinking about um, the great learning experiences that we have been part of or helped produce. And then from that, we try to sort of deconstruct it and think about what was going on. And I I'm, I'm going to say this. Um, um, that my money is with empathy and I think that I've, I've, I, I find empathy a word which instantly falls into disrepute because it's like the word soft skills I think empathy uh, is a word that makes us think about hugging people when they're upset or um, Clinton cards or you know it's this sort of soft kind of nice to have and for me I would put I would say empathy is this extraordinarily utilitarian powerful um must have so i think it's like the shire horse of the sort of the learning designer sort of um maneuvers really because if you can empathize with learners if you can empathize with what it's like to not know something but need to know it if you can remember what that's like if you can carry that knowledge forwards then i think instantly you have the that you have the scaffolding to do learning design so i, I it doesn't come from so i think about what leads so if you use empathy as a as a prism and you apply it to any curricula that curricula will change in terms of what it needs to um how it needs to to land with people and that's that's an inclusivity issue so you you use empathy as a prism over curricula and instantly you've got to start asking stickier questions about why certain sub things happen in a certain way why people have to learn in a particular way why they're looking at that example in a particular way Empathy is the one that changes it. And then when there was a um, in the in the slides just earlier about people trying to navigate Moodle or technology, uh, the one thing that sort of working with people through the pandemic um, made clear was that technology itself is a barrier. Uh, technology is not a neutral space in which learning happens. Technology is another thing people have to learn. It's another kind of conduit they have to go down. And if you look at technology through a more empathic point of view, you suddenly realize that people are worrying about how to access their information. They're worrying about how to store their information. They're worrying about everything else. And so for me, um, you've got the big things, curricular technology and empathy. You, you, you sort of move those together and suddenly you find these sort of these other things. You've got to start thinking about inclusivity. We know that um, learning experiences are, are enriched, enhanced, um, and given a foundation by communities of learners, why we come together to learn, learning is social. And then the whole idea that effectively really good curricular delivery is born out of facilitation, you know. So Tony's done a bit today with interactive slides, but no one likes being broadcasted out for more, you know, for more than 40 minutes, which is why we'll finish this soon. But um, to move to this more facilitated model is a function of empathy. To remember what it was like to be in any type of a learning experience when you're looking at your watch and however fascinating the lecturer is or however fascinating the the resources your brain is done you're gone to, to just to use empathy to to transform all of these maneuvers um for me that's that's been our big lead um and it's really helped us i think crack open some interesting experiences in disciplines that would otherwise perhaps 
characterize myself differently, right, Tony? I mean, the work we're doing around data, some of the, 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 the work we're doing right now, we're in a really fascinating place with that learning design, right? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think you're absolutely right. The, the empathy, the ability to empathize with uh, a, a set of people who you might never have met, uh, to understand what they need from learning experience, the ability to empathize with an SME, to understand why they're foregrounding certain knowledge over another, it, it does all come from that ability to empathize. So I think, as yeah, as you say, empathy, I think, is the sort of the, for, for us certainly, is the underpinning um, uh, key principle that, that that unlocks all of those those other aspects. Because it's basically about, and again, it's a word that instantly feels like you're talking about something that's ethereal um, yeah. or, or stuck in the creative arts only. But this idea of, of imagination, um, I think learning design is an act of imagination and um, and that's it. And and everything else is a function of that imaginative act. Everything else falls out of that. And for me, that's where my imposter syndrome has kind of um, been mitigated because I think, yes, I, I, I can say when I meet people, I don't say that, you know, what do you do for a living? Oh, I imagine things for people. But in, a, in so many ways, that is the job of a learning designer, that you imagine things for people. And then you scrutinize that vision to ensure that it's also working for the discipline itself. You know, it's got to it's got to work for all of the people involved. Um, but it's to never take your eye off the idea that learners are a um, a pretty nuanced bunch, um, you know, and and you've got to keep remembering what it's like not to know how to do something um what it's like to be on day one i think that that's for me one of the most powerful learning design maneuvers which is to always be a first year or to always be in induction week it's to always be a new member of staff if you can always operate in that imaginative space i think learning design is the thing that you that you can do and it also means that your expectations of experiences goes up because we all remember what it's like to have to be poorly onboarded, to have a really bad first day, to meet a lecturer who got our names wrong. We remember all of those things. And for me, that 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 memory, that that place of memory and imagination is the beginning, is sort of the mother load of, of learning design, really. Yeah, I totally agree. OK, we're going to probably round it up there because it's uh, we've, we've gone to nearly an hour. I'm just going to finish off with one last question uh, for those of you who are still with us. Um, and uh, this is just going to be really interesting. You might you might absolutely answer no to this. But based on what you've heard through that, do you think you could be a learning designer? So what we've tried to do in this uh, in this session is to clarify and unpack some of the things that learning designers do. And the, the aim of that has been to hopefully create a way for you to see yourself in this discipline because and I'm not going to say this lightly but I think there's a lot of disgruntled people in education at the moment at all sorts of levels um, who feel a little bit stuck and I I was certainly one of those people I felt that you know I uh, pretty much straight out of university went into a career in, in higher education and learning and didn't really know how to get out of that and I think learning design certainly offers a a new career path for people to, to put their educational expertise to use in a context that pays certainly equivalent to uh, to educational work. Um, if you do think that you are uh, you have some of these skills, I would certainly encourage you to have a look at, at LinkedIn and just start to browse job descriptions. Uh, look at what learning designers do, look at what's being asked. If you're not sure about what, uh, what some of these things mean, whether you think that you might be a learning designer, just, just drop us an email at Ding because we're always happy to, uh, to to chat about these things. That's what we do. So we'd love to hear from you to, to follow up. And um, yeah, I, I just think I would encourage you to explore it because I think you've probably spent you know years of your life investing in uh, your educational um, expertise, your knowledge, your skills. You've probably done a lot of teaching, supporting, learning. Um, you may well have the skills to be a learning designer. So uh, I, I would really encourage you to look at that. Katie's just put in the chat there, I like the emphasis on creativity, imagination, empathy, collaboration, community. Thanks, Katie, because I think, again, if you're, if you're involved, if you have been involved in education, you're probably doing all of those things. You're probably imagining, empathizing with students, you're creating new experiences, you're sequencing things, you're thinking about technology, you're thinking about assessment. These, this is the, 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 the nuts and bolts of learning design. So 
yeah, I, I would encourage you to, to explore that. Phil, any final words on? Only to um, say to admit to all of to admit again to all of the constituents of my imposter syndrome, which essentially that um, specificity, the idea that you have specific skills in a specific discipline, and that means that you are um, not valuable or cannot um, bring that sort of insight to anybody else. I think that's something that I would challenge um, now. And I say, and I, I would say that I think that, you know, many of the people on this call will certainly um, have gathered so much expertise, but they will think of it in a very particular way. And I think to sort of try and get outside of that and to look at it as a more meta set of skills, I think that that's, um, that's, that's an interesting thing to start doing, I think. That's what I would do. Brilliant. Thank you all very much. And thanks so much for your participation, your engagement, your responses to the Mentimeter, your questions in the chat. That's what makes these sessions much more enjoyable. So have a great rest of the day yep. and look forward to seeing you uh, at some kind of learning design activity experience, LinkedIn Live, very <laughs> soon. But thank you all. Enjoy the rest that, of your that day. That sounded like a threat, Tony, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We'll come and find you. No, no. Um, thank you all very much. We'll see you soon.